from Spam 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 Humbug. I'm Kenneth Cooley, better known as WTF Dragon, and this is a complete reading of Andrea Cantato's Through the Moongate. Chapter 19, False Step. Sega and Nintendo found themselves facing a new and increasingly more dangerous opponent in the early 1990s, PC computers. Just as the Commodore computer had caught up to Atari and Coleco a decade earlier, personal computers threatened to eclipse the new generation of video game manufacturers as the era of multimedia began. Can tell Steven, the ultimate history of video games. Some of my technical goals for U6 are 1024 tiles, shaded lighting, more NPC realism, even better looking dungeons. This will likely require 128K minimum on the initial Apple II release. Richard Garriott in the Gamers Forum on CompuServe, 1988. But then the PC took off so fast, and Apple cratered so fast, that we realized we would have no games to sell. There would be no market into which to sell those games. We had to completely change our staff. Richard Garriott, interview with Steve Burke for Gamer Nexus, 2016. The continued and growing success of his games had convinced Garriott not to change the way he worked. His latest product had still been purchased mainly by the Apple II community. For Ultima 5, Richard had to take advantage of all 64K of memory in his Apple II and improve the speed of disk loading. Two years earlier, Steve Wozniak himself had described Bill Budge's pinball construction set as the best software written for an 8-bit computer. Garriott's Ultima 5 was no less impressive than the software of his former CPCC colleague. Ignoring the age of the platform, Richard had already set to working on the sequel on his trusty Apple II, and had announced new ambitious technical features, requiring 128K of memory and offering more aesthetically pleasing dungeons. It would be a tragic error in judgment that would fester for several months before coming to light. Curiously, of all the promised features, only the tile size of the map would remain intact into the next Ultima game. That said, Microsoft, who had been commissioned by IBM for the development of the operating system, MS-DOS, and the basic interpreter underpinning it, had launched two games on the platform, Colossal Cave Adventure and Donkey.bas. The latter was co-written by Bill Gates and was included as an example of an MS Basic game. It was mocked mainly by Apple users for its simplicity and graphics. The first hint of change came with the PC Junior, IBM's response to Commodore and Apple. It was aimed at home users with its very interesting graphical and sound capabilities. On it, Roberta Williams created one of her most important and influential masterpieces, King's Quest, and saved her company along with it. The enthusiasm for the PC Junior would be quickly doused by the machine's many flaws. According to Richard Garriott, The IBM was a big, unattractive rectangular box. Instead of a true keyboard, it had calculator keys in the chiclet style. It had no obvious advantages. It didn't have substantially more memory, and its DOS operating system was strange and difficult to use. To me, at least, by every objective measure, it was either similar to or a little worse than the Apple. The PC Junior was not a success, and IBM pulled the plug on the project after less than a year, forcing Sierra to bring King's Quest to the Apple II and the Tandy 1000, one of the many IBM PC clones. IBM had broken completely with its common business strategy and had freely distributed all of the information needed to develop software and hardware for its platform. This decision was driven by economics to hit the market quickly and at a low cost. Software development was outsourced to Microsoft, and the hardware used chips that were already available. The amazing success and speed with which the standard was adapted by the industry surprised IBM. The platform grew rapidly. EGA video cards were introduced in 1984, replacing CGA and Hercules graphics options. And better sound options for PCs soon became available, such as the Roland MT32 and AdLib, with the Yamaha YM3812 chip coming along in 1987. These developments all served to make IBM PC-compatible machines much more attractive for video games. The platform was finally able to compete with the Apple II and the Commodore 64. With the introduction of the Analog Video Graphics Array Standard, VGA, in 1987, and the marketing of Creative's first Sound Blaster boards in 1989, the PC was destined to take over the market. The quickly shrinking market for Apple II games was losing ground even faster in the late 1980s. 
similar to that of the Commodore 64 and most other 8-bit machines, except for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Modern 16-bit and 32-bit platforms had doomed the 13-year-old veteran systems. Even the Apple II models that continued to sell well were actually 16-bit systems with 6502 compatibility modes. The install base of these machines was on the verge of being abandoned for more modern devices. The Garriott brothers' erroneous strategic choice had brought OSI close to the abyss, with several titles in development for platforms that would not survive long enough to see their completion. Origin faced the worst crisis since its foundation. At this point, it was necessary to completely revolutionize the company's modus operandi. Games had to be developed first for the PC, and almost everything else was a niche in the software market. Origin's staff, however, consisted primarily of experts for the 6502 platform. They lacked significant experience on PCs. With what few programmers they had with PC experience, having been involved in porting games to the platform. According to Dr. Cat, it wasn't just an accidental market forecast error. Origin was founded by guys who loved the Apple very, very much, and most of them only wanted to program games on the Apple. To make matters worse, Ultima 6 had already been in development for at least six months. The engine Richard had written needed to be rebuilt from scratch. Could Origin survive the time required to finish Ultima 6 on PC after already losing six precious months of development? Robert Garriott addressed the situation with practical spirit and a strictly numerical point of view. Considering that a large part of the staff had to be retrained, and that Origin would have to continue hiring new staff already familiar with PCs, the cost to keep the company running while porting the projects already in progress, including Ultima 6, amounted to at least $2 million. At a time when no game had yet reached the $1 million development budget threshold, this was a substantial sum. The completed games were intended to yield enough revenue to repay the investment, but considering that until then most of the non-Ultima games were not smash hits, OSI once again relied on Richard's saga. He had to score another hit, this time on a platform he wasn't familiar with, and he had to do so within a tight deadline as Origin could not afford to postpone Ultima 6. After six years of activity, the Garriott brothers had earned enough to be able to divest safely from the business, while the alternative was to invest in the company and hope that everything went well. Richard had just bought a house in Austin, Britannia Manor Mark II. Britannia Manor Mark I, the first version of his haunted house, had been his temporary residence in New England, placing most of his savings into it. Considering Origin's assets, the two Garriott brothers realized that they were unable to recoup that fateful $2 million dollars, by borrowing from banks and mortgaging Britannia Manor, they might be able to make it, yet they could not do so without risking everything, including potential bankruptcy and insurmountable debt in the case of failure. In a market where many products could not make returns on their investments, keeping what they had earned and perhaps selling off licenses and IPs to one of the many electronic entertainment giants seemed a sound option. Richard and Robert made it a matter of principle that they would make it. If we failed, not only would I lose the house, but my brother and I would lose the company, be millions of dollars in debt. We'd be left with less than nothing. But we bet on our capabilities. The race was on to get my next Ultima game out with acceptable quality before we ran out of cash. They took the gamble, giving Origin the required oxygen to retrain staff, hire new technicians and managers, and convert projects to the PC. Not only that, they raised the stakes by dissolving the affiliation agreement with Broderbund in a spectacular announcement at the summer CES in 1989. Broderbund announced that they had lost OSI, but had earned Distinctive Software Incorporated a short-lived affiliation, as in 1991, EA would purchase DSI, turning it into EA Canada, their oldest and largest studio, currently still active. The Austin office was a branch created with the sole purpose of providing Garriott with a logistical support to program Ultima, while all other Origin staff remained in New Hampshire. At the head office, in addition to the administrative sections and Robert's office, there were still developers working on Ultima projects and programmers responsible for ports. With two separate locations, the communication between employees in New Hampshire and Austin proved difficult. The team in charge of porting Ultima 5 worked in the old New England office, relying on receiving code from Richard's team in Texas from time to time. Origin had bought an AT&T 3B2 Unix-based minicomputer, but the communications still had to go through Robert's hands. Lacking a direct internal email system, which would arrive only a few years later, all necessary communications passed through too many operators before being sorted to the right offices. This would serve to create delays, and even, on occasion, loss of information. One of these mishaps occurred when Kenneth Arnold, from Texas, decided to propose one of many skill contests to engage Origins staff. According to Dr. Cat, 
Ken Arnold set up some logic and programming challenges just for fun. One of them was to use a made-up CPU he defined and find the fastest code to swap the contents of two registers. Us programmers in New Hampshire were to give our answers to Robert, who would use the 3B2 email to send them down to Ken in Austin. John Miles won the competition by handing Arnold the best solution to the puzzle using only 16 CPU cycles. Dr. Cat and Paul Nerath had remained in New Hampshire and entrusted their candidacy to Robert, who had forgotten to send it to Texas. Dr. Cat again. Paul Nerath had found a solution that only took 15 cycles. I submitted one using a similar coding trick, but a slightly different method, which also took only 15 cycles. In the second half of 1988, when Richard realized this serious error in judgment, the entire company's focus shifted towards this much-required transformation. The video game industry was about to shift away from the old 8-bit computers that Richard had grown up with, and accordingly, customer expectations grew as well. Origin would have to push itself to new heights to meet them. Adolescence was over. Origin had to change quickly, or it would perish. To learn more, subscribe to Spam 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 Humbug on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Anchor.fm at anchor.fm slash SSSH podcast or at spam 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 humbug.com. To find out more about Through the Moongate, visit thera.it. That's T H E I R A dot I T. You can also find the book on Amazon. And of course, you can learn more about the book and its author at andreacantado.com. That's A N D R E A C O N T A T O dot com. A big thank you to author Andrea Cantato for not only undertaking the effort of writing through the Moongate, but also for agreeing to allow for it to be read to you in this and following Spam 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 Humbug episodes. Tune in in a couple weeks' time for the next chapter. I'm going to make some games and I'll show them to you when I'm done.